Hi everyone, and um, thanks very much for joining us for our uh, webinar here talking about trade show marketing. So, um, trade shows are back on the calendar again this year after taking a little bit of a hiatus for a while because of COVID. Um, and anybody that works in the manufacturing and engineering sector knows that they're a, a massive part of, of the market and in that sector. Um, so we thought we would get two guests who have uh, quite a bit of experience in the trade show area to come in and have a chat with us just around about the experience during COVID for the last few years and, uh, and, and their plans for this year and what they look like. So um, if I could just introduce our guests first off. So on my virtual left, um, we have Kristen Randall. Um, of Haver and Bakker Niagara, um, and on my right we have Julie Andrus from McCluskey International. So thanks very much for for joining us, ladies from um, from Canada of all places. So um, a little bit of an international feel to this one than our previous webinar. So we appreciate you taking the time on a Monday morning to do this with us. And um, one of the things I'd like to start off um, is if. We could start with you, Kristen. If you could just uh, introduce yourself, tell us about your role with Haver Walker and, um, and how long you've worked in the sector and what you enjoy most about trade shows. Well, thank you, Peter. Uh, my name is Kristen Randall. I'm from Haver and Boca Niagara. I work out of our St. Catharines, Ontario, Canada facility. Uh, I've been with Haver for about 16 years now, actually 16 years as of last week. Uh, from marketing, in marketing from day one. And uh, I would say what I really like about trade shows is, you know, just all the people you get to see at each of these shows. Everyone's always so excited to be there, building connections. And also, as we'll talk about today, the chaos on the marketing side. Absolutely. And Julie, if you want to do the same, so tell us a little bit about your experience with McCluskey's and, and what it is about trade shows that makes you want to keep coming back. Thank you, Peter. Actually, I have been a little less time than Kristen with McCloskey. I've been there for 10 years and I am the global marketing and communications manager, really straddling virtually anything that touches a customer for McCloskey International. So not just the trade shows, but it's a really nice way to integrate trade show marketing into our overall strategy and our planning. And what I love about trade shows is the adrenaline. I really love the setup phase and, and the deadlines and getting ready to get everything in place. And then that moment when the show opens, it's all about the adrenaline. Okay. Yeah. Thanks very much. Now we talked about this the other day, whenever we did the briefing for this, um, anybody that's been doing trade shows for any period of time has, has plenty of war stories. So, um, I suppose I've been, Interested to start with a with a with a few and hear some of the the experiences that maybe as Julie mentioned the adrenaline maybe got the adrenaline going a little bit or or, or started to make it a little bit nervous about about your appearance at the show. So I'll kick off with with one example. And um, I remember when I was a trainee marketing manager with a company called Armatel here in Northern Ireland. They were ceramic tile retailers, distributors, and manufacturers. And we did a trade show down in Dublin for architects. And I stayed with. Um, a few friends in Dublin the night after the trade show had finished and had volunteered to look after all the inquiries from the show, which were, this was back in 1999. So this was paper forms, business cards stapled to them, um, all ready to go back to the office and distribute to the sales guys the following morning. Um, got got up on the Sunday morning and uh, went out to the car and this, the window of the car was smashed and the box fell with all of the inquiries from the show was no longer there. Um, so I spent the rest of the Sunday trying to figure out how I was going to tell the boss when I went back in on Monday that the show we had now spent a small fortune on and we now had none of the inquiries for. Um, so that was a, a, an interesting experience on that Sunday very, very early in my, in my marketing life. Um, it actually worked out in our favor in the end because the um, the trade show organizers were able to get us the attendee list for the show and we sent the mail shot on email a campaign out to them all explaining the, the sob story of what had happened and actually ended up with more inquiries than than we had taken at the show and um, from people who said oh that's terrible you know maybe you should come down come down and see us we might have a project for you at some stage so that was um one example of something that went wrong for me julie could we start with you then if you could give us an example of yours Well, Peter, a couple come to mind. Uh, one's very quick and easy. Um, it's a case of being at a very influential show 
and having my sales rep walk onto the floor and see absolutely nothing in our booth on the day before show open. So he called me and he said, there's a box of brochures. I see pens. There's nothing else. So I called our stand company at the time and I said, my rep is there and there's nothing there. And there's this long dead silence, nothing. So I broke the silence and I said, you forgot about my trade show, didn't you? And they had to admit they did. So the day before the show opened, they were scrambling through their warehouse and trying to get assets and everything pulled together and graphics done overnight and rushed to a show and they were based in a whole different state. So happy ending, it worked out okay, but lots of adrenaline on that one. The other one was a much larger issue. Uh, in fact, it was a 145 foot long issue. And uh, basically we were assembling this machine at Con Expo from the bolts up. And uh, ultimately it was going to be, you know, seven meter high and, and a lot of moving pieces. It arrived in 11 containers. And um, as we started to build, we suddenly realized that there was quite a pitch in the parking lot. And all of a sudden, we had the whole front end of this 70 feet that was suspended in the air and needed to be shored up. So we got welders and we got things to shore it up and then it looked terrible. So then we got carpenters and we got them to build a surround on it and that looked terrible. And then we got painters in to paint the carpentry and that still looked terrible because the inside looked not right. So then we got aggregate and we got landscaping stone. We poured it into the whole base of it. Then it looked great. But that was a real horror story because the whole process took, I would say, four days of agony, really. I suppose it's a lesson. I mean, before we move on to Kristen's, you know, once you've been doing these shows for a while, I think, Julie, from your experience there, you realize that stuff like that will happen and it might be a big thing and it might be a small thing but your ability to respond quickly and and come up with a solution ultimately is is, is a very important part of the job isn't it it's it's a critical part of the job honestly um if you love solving problems it is a hundred percent the best spot for you because there's always going to be a problem I have not had one show, and I've done hundreds of shows now, I have not had one show where a problem didn't arise that needed some kind of solution. Okay, okay Kristen, right, okay, war story time, tell us some of your experiences. Yeah, we, I have in Boca, we like to exhibit outdoors, and that has numerous challenges with it. So mine are all outdoors. The first one I can remember was Con Expo 2011. This is my very first outdoor show organizing. And we had this great little spot in the blue lot outdoors and we were constructing a tent and we had a building which was gonna kind of have like a kitchen office meeting area. And so we had all the equipment in place. And I remember the week of setup, I thought, you know, it's Vegas, it's outdoors. It's going to be sunshiny. We're going to pack shorts and t-shirts. We have a great time out there. It was freezing all week long. I mean, we had to go out and we all had matching Las Vegas sweatshirts and we were still shivering, just setting up this booth. So finally the show opens and it's the morning. And I mean, it's been a stressful week and I get to the booth probably an hour before showtime. And I realized that this so-called flat piece of land that my booth is on wasn't so flat after all. And it had rained all night. And in the corner of my booth, where the tent and this building matched up to each other, there had to be a good two feet of water. So I'm thinking, I'm in the desert. It's supposed to be warm. It rained all night. I'm still freezing. And I have this two-foot pool to deal with. What am I going to do? So turns out Vegas has these great uh, vacuums at the convention center that will vacuum up all your water because it, it just doesn't go anywhere. So that happened also again the second day. But... Of course, now we know how to deal with the problem. Um, but that certainly wasn't anything I ever expected to deal with at a trade show. Um, the other story that comes to mind in 2017, again, at Con Expo, we, we had this great spot in the silver lot this time, right in the corner. It was going to be like right where people were coming in the door. We were so excited about this spot. And a few weeks before the show, we checked the, the move-in schedule and realized we only have 48 hours to set up an entire wash plant in this fantastic spot we ordered how the heck are we going to do this? So I remember the trade show working with the, the manager there 
And he said to me, I'll make you a deal. If you can move in on this day at 2 a.m., you can get a 12-hour head start. And we took it. We were up all night putting this plant together. It was wild. Um, and then even the last Conexpo 2020, the last thing we did before the world shut down, um, we shipped a portable plant out there and realized that permitting changes from state to state. So, I mean, we shipped this thing six weeks out and had to get permit after permit for each state it went through. And finally, it landed in Utah and was involved in a traffic accident. And so we had to send people down to this manufacturing plant that we found where they spent a week fixing this machine before it ended up on site. So there is, like Julie said, there are so many problems, so many challenges to deal with, but it is exciting. And just when you think you've done them all, you haven't. There's something new around the corner. I mean, it's, yeah, I think it, it <laughs> speaks to that idea that, you know, you have to be really, really, really focused on the attention to detail stuff because anything that can go wrong will go wrong. Um, and you almost have to have those contingency plans, don't you, whenever you're planning these shows to think, you know, what what's the worst thing that could happen here and plan for that worst case scenario? Um, because very often you have to put that plan into action at some point. <laughs> so so thanks very much for those there interesting. Hopefully they give people who um with the experience that you two have particularly, you know, realizing that no matter how long you've been doing this, there there are still surprises that come along and that they have to be dealt with whenever whenever they arise. So um I suppose one of the questions relating relating it back to, to people doing the marketing job, you know, most a lot of what we do now is digital. Um, so in an increasingly digital world in the sector that we're both we're all familiar with, why do you think trade shows have remained as important as they have, Julie? If we could start with you there. I think the biggest reason, particularly in this industry, is because while a design is done on paper and is the, the birthplace of a machine, the final stage of a machine is something that people want to interact with. They want to actually have that experience. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if it's a loader, they want to sit in the seat. They want to feel the controls. If it's a, a jaw crusher like ours, they want to look inside the jaw chamber and see the depth. Mm -hmm. In reality, not necessarily in a 3D drawing or even in an animation. That said, I think there's a really good synergy between the two and combining technology plus that interaction that I think people crave and have very much missed over the last two years is, is a very good sweet spot that the industry came to out of necessity from the pandemic, not necessarily out of a desire. So, and I think now it's really starting to coexist quite nicely. Okay, how about you, Kristen? Yeah, I, I really think Julie said it. it's about the people, about the connections that you're going to make. You just can't do those over a video screen or on a telephone. It's it's not the same. And and it's, I mean, let's be honest, we're bringing toys to these shows. There's big trucks, big pieces of equipment. It's fun to climb on them, to touch it, to, to see what it's really going to look like when it comes down to your plant after you place your, your purchase order. So I think you just, some things just can't be replaced by video. And I think those people connections in the, experiences are definitely one of them it's because you, you mentioned something there julie about the whole experience and the opportunity that presents itself to sort of combine the the need for you know as as, as kristen said to have a machine there that people can climb all over and find out about the inner workings of it and um, both visitors and your competitors obviously and um as uh, on the on the, the the opportunity for digital technology then to sort of enhance that overall experience and finding the right mix between those two things to try and improve that, that visitor experience, if you like, when, when you get to the shows, that, that adds a whole new degree of complexity and, and skills to what is required to execute a trade show nowadays. Have you seen, um, have you seen, have you, have you done much of that stuff in the trade shows that you've been doing up until now, Julie? Prior to the to the slowdown, I'll call it a slowdown rather than a disruption. Disruption's a bit overused. Prior to the slowdown, um, I would say it was just used to accessorize. It was very much something that you would have on the side just to say, look at that fantastic, you know, drone video, etc. Um, in our new world, uh, we just did a show in January in Austin, and 
we had the machine on the stand. We had a display drum with all the different options. So there was that element of touch, feel, experience, interact physically. But we also introduced for the first time an interactive kiosk so that people could actually interact with technology and just scroll through and find exactly what they were interested in and see things in a very different format. So I think it's the way going forward for us now is to make sure that we're really delivering to both sides of the equation, the people who want that full interactive touch and people who want to be able to explore more and in depth beyond what you can possibly move on to a trade show stand in the limited time that you may have there. How about you, Kristen, and what's your experience of how you've used technology pre, pre-COVID, if you like, and what the plans would be now? Yeah, I think before COVID, it was very much secondary. I mean, we focused more on, you know, what does the stand look like? How are we displaying the equipment? And so we offer some diagnostic programs, for example. Which I always struggled with, how do I really display this? How, get, how do I get people engaged in the trade show floor? And having that kind of time to think about it and to work with it, we really focused on, well, like, let's get people involved in actually using it. And we worked on ways to use it on the trade show floor, whereas before it might just have been a screen that showed how it worked. So we really focused on, you know, how do people better engage with the technology side of our business? And also we had time and some resources to develop, you know, some really cool animations and things like that. So video was always kind of secondary for us as well, but we spent some time over the last year really developing that and doing stuff that was just cool and different and engaging. And so now we have this nice mix of both the digital and the actual equipment on the floor. And it, I think it's working quite well so far. We tried it at Mine Expo. We like the way it worked there. So we're going to continue forward with that. Okay. Um, and it sort of brings us back on to the next question. I wanted to ask you, you know, from the time I spent in the sector myself, I know how important the trade shows were to our general lead generation efforts. Um, can you tell us a little bit, if we start with you this time, Kristen, if you could tell us about how COVID and the subsequent cancellation of, of all the shows globally and what impact that had on your ability to generate leads over the last few years and how you dealt with that? Yeah, so what was interesting was, you know, I was at Con Expo when the COVID situation started and we flew home. And the very next week, I'm in my brand new home office, which I had to create since I was quarantined for two weeks. And all the calls and emails started to come in from everyone on our management team saying, okay, what are we doing with social media? So social media was a realm for our team, especially outside of marketing. That was very, everyone was hesitant to get involved in it. They weren't really sure about it and didn't know what to do about it. And then it's like, everyone woke up and thought, well, this is how we got to do this now. We got to get engagement in the social media. We have to be connected with people. We have to be present. And so we focused on, you know, really building that following on building really good blog content and videos to really drive that traffic and drive traffic to our website and just to create material that our sales team could share with their customers. I mean, they weren't going in the door, you know, every few weeks like they had been in the past. But what we did was we created content that they could share with them when they weren't able to visit. So rather than just, you know, sending a traditional brochure or saying, hey, did you check this out on our website? Now we're writing helpful blogs and we're creating videos and Show, sharing tips and tricks, and it kind of changed the way we develop our mar- marketing content quite a bit. Okay, okay. How about you, Julie? What what impact did it have on on the Trustgate? I think very similar to what Kristen's saying. Uh, we we didn't reach out, I think, as directly to the external end buyer, uh, but we worked very hard to make sure that our dealers had everything they needed. And as a part of that on the back engine, we were building our tech stack. So we were working very hard at looking into programs that would assist us to assist our immediate audience, our dealer network, and then would obviously trickle down and benefit to the end users. So we were looking at things like um, programs that would allow us to track IP addresses coming onto our website to be able to assess the interest in certain products and in certain offerings. Um, We were looking at um, CRM light. It wasn't pure CRM, but we were really trying to align those marketing analytics and that marketing research and the marketing information into one really comprehensive way to reach out digitally, as opposed to being able to go out to the show. Okay. Okay. I mean, outside of the big global shows, um, you know, like your Con Expos and your Biomas in Munich, you know, there are a lot of smaller but very significant shows still like Hellhead and 
the UK at Stein Expo in Germany. Um, and I go on that we're, we're all going to in, in just over a month's time. Um, what can you tell us a little bit, Julie, if we start with you on this one? What what other sort of in-person events do McCluskey's use as a as a lead generation and to assist with the sales and marketing efforts? In the past, we've used a few things. Um, one of the most popular, not just for us, but for our customers, are customer open days and to actually let them come out to a uh, to a site. With COVID, of course, there were a lot of site restrictions at all of our customer sites. So we really had to put that completely aside. Um, but we're really looking forward to starting up that kind of interaction again around machines and at a customer site. Uh, the other thing that we're really looking forward to firing up again are our dealer events. Uh, they're always very popular to get everybody in one spot, the training, the, the um, networking, the team building, the excitement, frankly. You know, when you get a bunch of people all passionate about something in a room, really miss that and looking forward to kicking that off again and getting that going for McCloskey. Okay, and how about you, Krista? We, uh, <clears throat> we participate in uh... In the United States, we have an association called the National Stone, Sand, and Gravel Association. So they run shows like Ag One, for example. Um, we've been more involved in their events and being part of their board and things like that the last couple of years. Um, in Ontario here, we have a local association called the Ontario Stone, Sand, and Gravel Association. So we're pretty close with them. We always participate in their health and safety seminar. They do an operations tour, which stopped here uh, last fall. So we had, uh, I think, 50 producers come in through and do a plant tour with us. Um, so those sorts of things. We run a dealer academy, which was unfortunately virtual last year, but we're hoping to bring that back. We tend to do that biannually. And then even with some of the publications, like Pitt and Quarry Magazine is a, a popular magazine here in North America. We get involved with a lot of their events, uh, such as their roundtable, which happens every summer. So just ways of sharing what's going on in the industry and best practices, that sort of idea. And then also, actually, this week we're running our annual University of Toronto Screening Basics Seminar. So there's a mineral processing class at University of Toronto. And their professor and I work together each year to put on a half day seminar for these these young students who are studying in the realm of mining. Very good. I mean, it, it sort of connects back to the earlier point that you made, Kristen, around um, the trade shows and all those in-person events being important because people want to get under the bonnet, if you like, of the machines and want to sit sometimes literally under the bonnet of the machines and, 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 and see exactly what's going on and how it's working. But is there another element of it that, that, that means that I, they stay important is is the part about it's that wisdom of the crowd element so um you know if you put 30 people or 50 people at, a, at an open day or on your stand at a trade show and all of them together think that buying your machine is a good idea then it gives all the individuals who are there a lot more comfort that somebody else thinks this is a good idea too so so the risk is automatically reduced by the fact that lots of other people seem to want to do this as well. Um, and, and, it's, and that's something you lose, I think, with the digital interactions you have with customers. They don't, they're not able to quite get that same feeling of, but everybody thinks this is a great machine um, and I need to buy one because I, I want to be part of that crowd of people, I suppose. Is that is that another important part, particularly with the open days, Julie, I suppose, with your point, you know, that if you can put a lot of potential customers on the side of a happy customer who's made the investment, the conversion rates from that tend to be very, very good. They do. They do. Um, whenever you get uh, uh, brand ambassadors in an existing customer site talking about how they're using it and, and what they love about it, and then you bring other people there to hear their stories, I think it's very, very powerful. Um, during, during the pandemic, we had to do it by video. It was customer testimonials. Um, but I think really being there and experiencing it with other people who are interested in the same uh, format or product or or crushing spread, screening spread, it, it has a huge impact. It really does. Herd yeah, mentality. Move on to you, Kristen. I suppose, you know, my experience of the industry, no matter where you went in the world with the industry, is you know, the people who work in it are a sociable bunch. Um, they like interacting <laughs> with other people. They like speaking to other people who are using their machines. 
same machines that they're using to try and find out have they found out any other ways of maybe eking another few percent out of it production wise or or workarounds that can just make the thing perform a little bit better is that is that part of the reason why you think people still like to go to those in-person events absolutely i think you're going to trust your peers before you trust you know me as a manufacturer saying i have the best machine ever right you know you want to talk to people who have experienced that product and used it successfully and and yeah they're they're in the same boat as you like if you're if my fellow producer down the street from me is running Corey X and I'm running Corey Y and he has really good success with this machine. I should probably listen to him because he knows exactly what he's talking about and he knows or he's trying to accomplish exactly what I'm trying to accomplish. So I think that that peer uh, feedback is so important and customers. I mean, we've known this for a long time. Customers are your best marketers. Let them tell the stories for you. Okay, very good. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, now, when we talked about this last week, there was three elements of, of the, the plan and process that we wanted to go through. So we want to talk about the pre-show experience, the at-show experience, and then, and then what happens post-show. So thinking about pre-show, um, if we think about two of the biggest global shows, which we've mentioned already, Con Expo has been mentioned several times in Las Vegas, and, and Bioma down in Munich in Germany. Um, can you Tell us, starting with you on this one, Kristen, can you tell us how far out from those big shows the planning process starts? So we have this really awesome alarm clock where the show emails you about two and a half years before the show and says, you need to buy your space. So that's my alarm to go, oh, we have to book the space in two months. I better get the team together and let's talk about what we want to do. So that's the point at which, yeah, we get together. We talk about what we want to accomplish at that show, even though it may be two and a half years away. Um, you know, we, we put a plan together. We say, okay, we think we need this much space. This is what we want to show in the space. This is why these are the people we think we want to bring. So it's, it's a very, it's very much a framework at that point, but that's definitely when you start to plan, because if you're, spending a pile of money on buying square footage for a show, you better have uh, some idea as to what it is you want to accomplish there. Yeah, and I suppose, Julie, there needs to be a degree of flexibility in there as well, because very often you're talking about products that that don't exist on the market yet. So you're, there's yeah. a lot of unknowns around, is it going to be that size? Is it going to be that weight? You know, is is this is it going to be that height? Is, is this going to work? You know, how, how do you, how do you go about making sure whenever you're booking the stand space at those shows, Julie, that, that you, you're, you're, you're going to be able to fit the thing that doesn't exist yet onto your stand? There is a lot of not even a glimmer in the eye of the engineers yet, big shows. Uh, we're always dealing with, in, in fact, coming up with Balma and Con Expo coming up within this next year, we're still working around the configuration of what the machines will be. Um, so it is, it is very, very much a flexibility game. What we do try to do is we, we set it up so that there is always a standard footprint for a structure. And then we work around it for the machines. That said, I've had a few shows where I've had to suddenly adjust the size of the structure down because we have some exciting machines. And frankly, that's what people are there to see. I, it, my, my beautiful chairs are exciting, but they really want to see, you know, an R series screener. So we have had to constantly adjust and we do that even as little as, you know, five, six months ahead on a big show, we're still tweaking the footprint and the floor plan. Um, the other thing is uh, I was thinking about Kristen's comment about two and a half years ahead, as I'm leaving our hotel rooms in Germany after Bama, I'm booking for the next show three years ahead because they go in Germany. You have to be right there and soon as you hand over your room key say i'll have that back in three years thank you i'll get you the dates as soon as they're confirmed and uh it is a lot of planning ahead for this sort of thing but as you say peter you can only plan so much that far in advance you're going to need to be flexible yeah. okay and i mean connected to that i suppose you know we're talking about moving big lumps of metal and big lumps of machinery all across the world here i'm sure that requires a fair, um, well, I know that requires a fair amount of collaboration across various different departments, sort of within the organization. Could you talk to us a little bit, Kristen, about, about who you're working with at the early stages there, whenever you're booking stand space and deciding what goes on display? 
Yeah. So we talked about, you know, when that warning comes out that you need to book your space. So that's, you know, that's the point where you say, okay, I think it's going to look something like this. And then once you start to figure out what those machines are going to be, um, they require a little bit more attention than normal machines. So you might want to use, let's say a bit better quality paint, or you might want to put some decals on them that are a bit different, or maybe we're going to set up, you know, some screen meat on the machine a little bit different. Um, they do require extra care. So I know, way ahead of the machine or way ahead of showtime i'm on our production floor every day with the operations team and these guys work hard they know it's a trade show coming up they know i'm picky so you can always tell when it's trade show season i walk on the floor and they're like uh oh here's kristen again what does she want today um but these guys work so hard and i mean i only wish i could take them all to the show just to see what what it is that they produce and how it looks and how people react to it uh but it's a it's a daily probably a daily meeting with production to keep things on track. And just like the show, things go wrong and you come across things that you thought you had planned out and it turns out they're not working and you just need to work at it one day at a time and get it ready. I suppose in terms of the production schedule, you know, if you're producing, Julie, if you've got a machine that's the first time it's being produced and it's being produced for a show and there's a slot in the factory for, for it to get made, you know, very often, you know, the customers rightly so come first. So, um, I suppose there's a degree of stress around schedules getting moved and things and you start getting very close to the date that you know the thing has to be on the sea for and, and you're not and, 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 and there's a suddenly a client project that's taking priority in the factory so um, how, how do you go about sort of dealing with that and staying on top of that with all the people in the organization? Well, particularly in this strange environment we're in right now with supply chain shortages and production uh, headaches worldwide across our industry, um, it does get interesting. That said, most of our show machines are pre-sold to customers and they get very excited that they're getting a show ready machine because it does have all those really nice finishes and all those little tweaks. And, and so um, usually I'm fairly solid on our production schedule because it is already spoken for by a customer. And it's very exciting for them because if I take it to a show like Con Expo, we make sure we put their decal on it and, and promoting their, their company and everything. So um, it, it can be tricky. Um, I think really we've been very lucky in the long run but trade shows are a little unpredictable. So we'll see how the next two go. Okay. Okay. And then thinking about, I mean, you spend a lot of time, obviously, leading up to these shows and, and a significant budget investment to go and do them. So you can't just turn up on the first day and it's not a build it and they will come sort of idea. You know, there's a, there's a, there's a degree of work needs to go in pre-show to make sure that you have the visitor numbers and, and the right people coming along to see you at the show. Can you tell us a little bit, if we start with you, Julie, about some of the pre-show activity that you would do to try and drive interest and drive visitors to your booth when the show's happening? Yeah, that's an interesting question because we've been changing it up quite a bit recently. Um, you know, it used to be when I started in this business, the, the postcard was the ultimate holy grail of the way to reach out to people for a trade show. And, you know, the show provided these templates and you thought this is magic and I'll just plug in my logo and I'll say this machine is going to be here and they will all come and they will actually keep my postcard on their fridge and they will share it with their friends. And we're in such a different world now we really need to reach out to them in new ways. Um, and in fact, with all of the privacy restrictions happening in different geographies between GDPR and Castle and everything else, the way that we approach our lists has changed completely because we need to respect the privacy requirements in each geography and how we reach out. So we have found that the um, most effective way to do it is through digital opt-in. So if they are actually approaching us and saying, yes, I wanna hear more about what you're doing at the show, that's one method. The other method is through social media, obviously. Engage, 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 engage. Get people excited ahead of the show. Tell them what's going to be happening. Make sure that they're coming on board with you and that you have that built in, build in, build in excitement. And then the third pillar that we really operate on is the media relations side. And we spend quite a bit of time ensuring that we have relevant news to share via a news conference at a show 
um, sending out information ahead of the show and getting as much coverage as we can out there from an editorial perspective. Going hand in hand with that again, of course, is advertising to raise some awareness and get people excited as well. So those are, those are the four main pillars that we do. Of course, there's always lots of ways that you can get out and talk to people, but those are the main ones we use. Okay, how about you, Kristen? Is there anything different that you're doing there that you want to tell us about? No, I mean, we certainly do everything that Julie has, has talked about. Um, other than that, just thinking, you know, just getting the sales team on board with, hey, the show's coming up, here's what we're displaying, here's what's going to be new. You know, when you're out visiting your customers, just make sure you're, you know, checking in, checking in with them to see, you know, are you coming? Um, can we meet you there? Can we have dinner when we're there? Um, just to try and get that engagement before they go. And maybe they haven't even thought about going. So, you know, just reminding them that, hey, that Egg One or the Con Expo is coming up. We hope to see you there. And I think, is, is there an element of no matter how, you know, no matter how far ahead you might start planning for the show, there are some things that you just can't, that, you, that can't be done until the last minute anyway. And it's only mm -hmm. in the month or two, maybe, before the show date that people are really starting to think about it and will start paying attention to it because they're thinking about their trip and how they're going to try and make the most of the trip or how they're going to try and justify three or four days out of the office to go to the show in the first place. And so is there a degree that you know, no matter how much planning you're doing, there's an inevitable chaos in that three or four week lead into the show just because of the nature of when you can actually do those communications, Kristen? Oh my gosh, yes. Um, yeah, you can be a few weeks out and think you have everything nailed and then you realize, oh, we have to deal with this issue or you know, whatever it may be. And then, but the beauty thing about digital and social media is you can change messages and, and your strategy and your schedules on the fly. It's not, not like the old days of when you were only doing print and you had to have your material to the magazine six weeks out or whatever the timeline was. I mean, you can really be uh, agile and change, change things as you go. So thank goodness for that. I mean, I think especially in North America, we are the kings and queens of last minute. Things are constantly changing even hours before this stuff happens. Hey, how would you, Julie? I mean, is that your experience as well? That, you know, the last couple of months is always a bit of a whirlwind. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and I, not just uh, purely on that sort of marketing promotion side, but when you get down to the actual logistics. So we'll have, you know, hotel rooming lists so crisp and so beautiful down to whether they want a feather or a foam pillow. And then... <laughs> chaos is reaped across the entire thing in the week or two before all of a sudden it's like oh actually i'm bringing six customers or yeah no i actually want two nights and i really did want a foam pillow never mind the feather pillow so you know it gets a little chaotic around those logistics as well um even around the display i i night before con expo was opening on one episode I had uh, the machines all positioned and we have track mobile equipment. So all the tracks were pristine, painted beautifully with a black gloss, looked like basically an auto show quality. And our upper management came onto the booth and quite rightly wanted a machine moved. And they were right. When I looked at it, my first instinct was, oh God, don't move that machine. We've just got the tracks painted and dried. But when we moved it, it looked much better. But then we had to paint the track. So the team was getting the machine moved and prepared and ready for the show basically until two in the morning. Is that something we could have anticipated? Absolutely not. Could we have anticipated that suddenly 20 more hotel room, rooms were needed a week before the event? Absolutely not. We can plan as much as we want, but there's an inherent chaos leading up to the show. And I think it hits particularly in the last two weeks. Okay, okay. And leading, I think another big part of the design element, I mean, you touched on the stand layout and design there, Julie, but a, a huge part of, of the show is, is you know, a good booth design. So how important is it to have a good booth designer for the show? And Julie, I suppose, um, you know, how, how do you go about qualifying these people whenever you're, whenever you're looking for, for a good partner? Well, we recently just changed our provider, actually, coincidentally, um, after having a relationship with one for about eight years. Um, 
I have generally divided the world up a bit. I have one stand designer over in the European rest of world market. And then I have one that does primarily North America and the Americas. And the reason I do that is, is more logistics driven by getting the assets moved from country to country. Shipping from North America all the way over to Russia is a little more involved than shipping it from Germany. So we do have two companies. The way we vet them is really based on their experience. Because when we're moving in this huge equipment, we really need somebody who understands that you don't put the plants in first and that the machines have to go in first. And we have had that before where they landscaped and then the machines just rolled right over everything. So, you know, understanding our business and the equipment is very important. Understanding um, what we're trying to achieve. In the past 10 years with McCloskey, I would say that what we are trying to achieve out of each show visually and in the structure and the stand design has changed radically. Um, it, it's not even a, a small change over that 10 years. And I think we're going to continue to evolve. So I think at this point, we really need to continue to have agile uh, partners in this area who are going to continue and evolve and grow with us. And that means, you know, continual communication, relationship building, and assessments. Okay, and a key part of that, I think, I think Julie, is, you know, making sure that they, they stay hungry enough um, to keep coming up with really good stand concepts because, you know, as, as the as the person organizing the show internally from Tluskies, I suppose you've got so many things to think about that you want, you need a partner you can trust to say these, this is the stand, this is the number of people we're going to have, these are the areas I kind of think I'm going to need, but I need you to help me out here um, in terms of best practice and what's happening across other sectors and industries. Yes. Yeah. And it, it is a constant assessment just to see, you know, where we're at and making sure that, you know, everything is staying fresh and they do need to take a lot of that work away from you because, you know, you're working on so many different things for an upcoming show. I'm working on dealer meetings and dealer entertainment and training sessions and news conferences and the actual, you know, equipment technology moving in. So you need a customer you can absolutely rely on to take all of those logistical elements away from you and come up with some fresh designs. Okay, and how about you, Kristen, have you, what would you, do you, do you think that going back to Julie's point, I suppose about, you know, needing to know that the machines go in first and then you go in afterwards. Um, do you think it's important that your booth designer necessarily has experience in this sector or do you, do you find cross sector tends to work just as well? Uh, yeah, that, that's an interesting question. I, I think I can't see why it wouldn't hurt to, you know, be an expert in our sector or at least heavy equipment in general. Um, I mean, this is heavy stuff. Once you get in place, you really don't want to move it. Um, and I think uh, similar to Julie, we've been working with a, a house now for, we're on our third trade show house. I think we've been with them four or five years now, but they, it's very much a relationship, like any relationship, you have to have good communication and you have to you know, understand the goals and what you're trying to achieve in this, in this event. And uh, if you don't have it, if it feels off, it's it's just not going to work. And I've been in that position with two previous trade show houses where, you know, it was okay at the start and we just weren't seeing eye to eye and it just, it was not working. And you can't, I mean, you have a matter of days to get this stuff in place and done. And if it's not working, if you can't communicate with these people, it's just not going to come together the way you want it to. Um, and even the people, the, the show house I've been working with, I get the same manager on my floor for the last several shows and he's just fantastic we know each other i can call him anytime i know if i have to step away for a meeting or a lunch or something he's he's got it he's, he can handle it and if something comes up he will call me but i don't need to be there every second of every day anymore so it's it's paramount like julie said if someone's what's going on you're trying to organize your people your dealers your events you can't be on the floor every second watching this this equipment come into place and watching the whole thing come together okay. Okay, I want to I want to go back a few steps actually because there's a question that's just come in from Tim Monroe of the Smiley Monroe who we were we were talking about before we went on air. And um, Tim's just said, do Kristen and Julie talk about the success of the return on investment of the previous show at the planning stage? 
in order to determine you know the space book and size on the on the budget for the next show is that something that's part of those conversations at the very start we start with you julia now short answer absolutely um we, we we look back always we look forward always and we look back at what worked really well and uh we look forward to things that didn't go well being you know addressed so i think it's a very key part in fact right after every show i will do a post-mortem while it's fresh on the plane uh because if i wait until i get back to the office and everything starts piling up that you know is resulting from the show it won't it won't be fresh in my mind so I will do a post-mortem, the good, the bad, the ugly, uh, on the plane, on the way home. And then that serves as the basis document for working on the next one. And uh, it's very important to do that from the planning side. From the return on investment side, that is so much more complicated. Um, and it brings up the fact that I very rarely um, will jump in and use the term ROI. I prefer return on engagement. So our return on engagement is a measurement that I find is a little bit easier to explain to our uh, management teams because I can talk about how many people started communicating with a dealer after a show, after they had seen something, how many people asked for more follow-up information in the way of collateral or anything like that. So um, do we take the last show's ROI into account? Yes, you can't ignore ROI. There are people that will always want the number for sure. But I think the return on engagement for the planning stages of the next show is the most important to us. Okay, how about you, Kristen? Yeah, uh, similar to Julie, we look at, you know, ROI and ROE on that. So, you know, between the last, let's say it's a Con Expo, between the last Con Expo and this one coming up, you know, which of those leads have we turned into good customers? What, uh, have, we, have we signed a new dealer? Um, what, it's hard to measure exact ROI in a trade show, but you know, what, what big deals have we had come through the door since the last one that were with people we met at that show? And then even from the planning perspective, you know, we'll go back and, and say, okay, where are all these leads coming from? If you have, for example, um, half your leads are from the state of Arizona. Well, obviously your sales team that's based in Arizona should be at that show. If I'm getting no leads from Canada, why would I send Canadian reps to the show? It might not necessarily make sense. We look at that in terms of who should be there as well. And, you know, what kind of leads are we seeing? What kind of meetings are we going to have at the show and make sure we have the right team in place. Okay. Okay. If we move on a bit now to, um, to the app show, well, um, I want to talk a little bit about setup week. Um, I have mixed feelings about setup week because while while I'm there, I think I hear it more than I hear anything else. But <laughs> after the show, I always sort of some of the best memories I have are from are from the weeks that in in the setup. I think there's a real there is a real sort of community and camaraderie, and I'm conscious that I've totally contradicted myself here as well. But, but there is that sense of you know everybody's there, and there's that sense of anticipation. Um, before the show opens and you're getting there before anybody else is getting there and you're getting to have a look around and see what everybody else is doing. So what, what we start with you, Kristen, what's your overall feeling of setup week and, and the value or the enjoyment that it brings? I would say my love for it increases with each show. At the beginning of my trade show life, I hated it. It was just, I didn't know what to expect. I didn't know how to plan. Everything fell apart. I would cry. Like it was awful. <laughs> but it gets better. And why well, I, I like a few things about Setup Week. I like I usually bring one person from our team to help me, you know, work with the trade show house and get some of that heavy lifting in place, you know, just get a second set of eyes from our team on how does this look and that sort of thing. And when you bring someone new to that, so I brought someone new at the Mine Expo show we just did in September. Um, and to see the show through their eyes, like the wonderment of how does this actually come together, you know. The night before the show opens, it still looks like chaos. And then you walk in the next morning and it's pristine. And you look at that person and they're like, how did they do this overnight? It's it's so much fun to see it through their eyes. And the other thing I really like about Setup Week is we may be in an industry where we have competitors and we don't necessarily want to interact with those competitors. But on the marketing scene, I think that's a bit different. Some of my best friends and my go-to people when I need advice and help in this industry our marketing people who are working for our competitors. So I've built this great network of friends and colleagues who are all in marketing in our industry. 
And even if it's not a trade show, even if you're struggling with something like I called, I called someone in marketing who worked for a competitor about HubSpot, for example, I was looking at using HubSpot and I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do with it. So I called a few people and I said, you know, are you using this? How are you using this? And everyone is so willing to help and just be there for you. And you can meet with those people during setup week when your sales team's not there yet. And, you know, you know, work on those connections a little bit more and get to know each other while you're sweating it out on the trade show floor. Okay, what about you, Julie? What's your experience of trade show setup week? 100% agree with Kristen on the um, on the competitors as friends model. Um, it's a lot of fun in the setup week. Uh, before the whole sales competition comes into play and uh, the, the contest to get the most customers onto your stand, there is that level playing field. Does anybody have a Leatherman? I need to cut this or do that. And, and, you know, it's, it's fantastic. And I, when I started um, at my first BAMA back in 2013, I was not familiar with this model. And I was like looking over my shoulder at people who were coming onto my booth with great suspicion. <laughs> and uh, my setup team at the end of the day, a very hard day, all of a sudden, all these competitors are coming onto my stand. They're on their bicycles, they're all rolling on, and my team are going into the bar and opening up the beer and the wine and handing my competitors these beverages. And I was gobsmacked because I'd never seen anything like it. Now it's so normal for me because it is the best time of a show in my mind to get to know everyone on a level playing field. We're all there to get a job done. We're all there to, to enjoy each other's company. And it's very, very different. Um, that said, that's usually the first front end of the setup. You start getting closer to opening day and then the adrenaline, the adrenaline really starts to kick in, right? And I, you know, I had one dealer who was actually at a bar taking odds and bets that I wouldn't have the stand finished in time at Con Expo 2014 because he'd been there at eight o'clock at night, the night before the show opened. He lost, fortunately, <laughs> but you know, it's, it's crazy adrenaline in those last two days beforehand, because while everything seems to be going swimmingly, all of a sudden when the deadline looms, you're, you're going crazy. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. And I mean, you touched on a little bit, trip set up week, one of the best things about not I have to be careful. I was no, I can't be careful about how I say this. So one of the best things about Setup Week is the sales guys aren't there yet. <laughs> um, so, so if we move on to talk about the stand team, then um, what can you tell us? Just to give people an idea who aren't familiar with these sort of massive shows, Kristen, what size of a stand team do you typically have if you think about Con Expo and and so and how does that differ from some of the smaller shows? Yeah, uh, Con Expo, I think we usually have, so for some reference, our booth is usually around 3,000 square feet or in an outdoor space. Um, so we typically bring between 12 and 15 people. So that's going to be the president of our company out of the Canadian facility here, the VP of sales, uh, all the product managers come because they're the ones with all the knowledge. Uh, we talked before about, you know, looking at where leads tend to come from. So we don't take all of the salespeople, but we try to bring a good cross section based on the territories that we typically see. And, and maybe, you know, we want to introduce a new sales rep to trade show life. So that's a good opportunity to do that. I go as marketing, of course, um, to fill in for, you know, marketing needs, press, fill in where people need breaks. Um, so it's, it's really a, a cross section of everyone that keeps, keeps the tra trade show going. Okay. And how about you, Julie? I mean, what sort of stand team do McCluskey have at some of the major shows? For the major shows, uh, for reference, uh, we usually have uh, for McCloskey dedicated about 20,000 square feet. And then for um, Lipman, which is our sister company, it is another 10,000 square feet. So we're usually around 30,000 square feet of exhibit space. Uh, we bring in a team, I would say, combined between the two companies of about 25, maybe 30. But we also rely on our dealers to man the stand. So it's a wonderful cooperation, actually, because while they all have their dedicated territories, when we're at a show, they are more than willing to go and talk to somebody beside a machine from a totally different area and to keep them engaged while 
the sales rep for that area is found. So it's a really good mix of McCloskey and our dealer network. The other thing is that we bring in engineering. Um, it's really valuable when we're introducing new products at a show to have the engineers who designed it right on the site and able to talk about what they did to create the unique selling features of that machine and, uh, and how it works. We also have an aftermarket side there at all times so that they can talk to um, people about our aftermarket services around warranty and service, et cetera. And then we also have um, the, um, the supply chain there and the purchasing so that they can have um, people come up to them and have meetings and talk about our supply chain and uh, purchasing needs at the show. Okay, it's, it's interesting you mentioned actually that diversity of roles on the stand because I remember going to, with Tim Monroe actually, who's one of the first people who commented earlier, um, we went to the Con Expo pre-show briefing, it was in Chicago, I think it was for, I think it was pre-2014, and it was in the August before the show was happening in the March, and the NSTA I think were presenting a whole lot of, or the, no it was the AM, it was the AM, were presenting a whole lot of data around the visitor profile, and the survey that they had done of previous visitors and one of the most striking things for me from that was they said an awful lot of people who visit the show were saying you know we we see the sales guys we know your dealers because we meet them they're the people who we meet just as part of the everyday operation of their business but what we what we would like to see more of on the trade show stands are other people from the organization so we want to meet the people who are designing the products we want to meet the guys who are looking after the spares and the after sales side we want to speak to the project managers we want to find out who's running the business you know and, and find a little bit more out about them is that something Kristen based on what Julie said there do you have that sort of diversity of, of different roles and different parts of the organization so it's not just like 20 or 30 sales guys starting on the stand every every uh, every show that there is that broad sort of range yeah i'm glad julie brought up engineering that's something we have we've done for most of the bigger shows at least as well as bringing someone from engineering who you know again can talk to the new products how things are designed um, and just really bring that aspect to the team as well and then you know in addition to our product managers we definitely have the service team there because that's something people are always wanting to talk about you know service and maintenance and you know if i buy this machine what's my what's my life with it going to look like kind of thing purchasing isn't something we have we have brought to the show but certainly something to look at going forward yeah i think it is a good one actually because it's very easy for, <laughs> it's i'm not making many friends during this i've realized with some of the things i'm going to say but but it's very easy for for purchasing to be a bit of a blocker sometimes um and whenever they because because there's because there's, usually there's a distance between them and the customer in terms of the, a, a personal relationship, and I always find that once because of the the, the range of roles of people that we had on the stand, that the relationships across the organisation were better, whether it be finance operations engineer and or sales or after sales, you know once you've had a, a beer on the stand with a customer, um. When he emails you asking about payment terms or asking you about you know letters of credit or whatever it is, the conversation tends to go a lot better because the more of that personal relationship has sort of been developed over time. Is that is that been your experience as well? Yes, absolutely. It changes everything when you can okay, meet someone one on one. Yeah. Okay. So we have another question come in here from from Eamon Connolly. So, and um, he's asked. While at the show, what tips would you give for networking with co-exhibitors? After all, not all of them are competitors. Julie, can that's we start a really with good point. Yeah, yeah, that's a really good point, actually. And and we do quite a bit with uh, other people in the industry at these shows. They're a gathering place. Let's admit it. It's very rare that you can get that many people in various uh, capacities in one space, right? So <clears throat> other co-exhibitors, absolutely. Um, they can be current suppliers of ours. They can be um, people that are offering us something that's new that we haven't seen before that would augment the productivity or capability of our equipment. Um, it's absolutely a great place to, to really network and get to know a lot of people at once. Okay, and you, yeah, I can think of one specific example on the marketing side of things. Um, I think it was a Con Expo 17. 
uh, we had a vendor approach us with some software to create a sales app, which is something we had kind of looking at at the time. Um, it was a vendor based in Syracuse, New York, actually. And they stayed in contact with us probably for a year or so after the show. And then we got really interested in building such an app. Uh, so I went down to Syracuse and met with them. And we looked at what we could do together. And late, not late, probably midway through last year, we launched the sales app that we worked on together that was a result of this company approaching us at the at the trade show. Until then, we really hadn't thought about how we would build such a thing. So from the marketing side, it worked out quite well for us. Yeah, I think they're, you know, it's one of those ones that um, I've had them myself at trade shows where you come, you come across people who are selling something that maybe you don't need now, but, you know, you stay in touch because things change and a few years down the line, um, the situation might evolve and you might have, end up being of some use to each other. So, yeah, it's a good one. Another question has come in from um, Marissa Pellegrini, who's asked, um, this, is a, this is an interesting one, if you could give one to two pieces of advice to a new trade show marketer or coordinator what would it be and i'll start i'll give you that one the julie nice easy question to start with julie. <laughs> there's so many that i would go back and tell my tell myself 10 years ago um but i would say that um number one is find a really good program to keep track of all the details the devil is in the details on these trade shows. And if you have something that really works for you, and it doesn't matter if the best thing for you is a piece of paper and check boxes, or whether it's a nice high-end monday.com color-coded visual aid, whatever it is, that I think is really, really important to help you try and keep track of everything. Um, the other thing is really don't sweat it at the front end when things go wrong. As we discussed earlier in this, things are going to go wrong. It's never necessarily a reflection of you as a trade show marketer. It is often a reflection of what is going on in the trade show around you. So, you know, you have to develop a little bit of a thick skin there and say, all right, well, I did everything I could have done to prevent this from going south, but things are going to happen. So, you know, that's, that's a very key part of it is just to be kind to yourself and realize it's a, it's a bit of a crazy start for anybody in this industry. Okay. What about you, Kristen? What advice would you give to somebody starting out on the trade show marketing circuit? Yeah. One thing I think would be to say, and I realize you haven't been in your industry long, let's perhaps, but look at your industry and you know reach out to some of your competitors through social media like their marketing teams through social media and say hey i'm new to this company i'm new to the industry i'm preparing for trade show xyz appreciate connecting with you how and you know any tips or advice you guys could give me would be great i would be happy to offer anyone you know from my war stories you know things that have helped me along the years and i think that could really help you to start to build that network right up front i mean Social media is wonderful for doing that. It certainly wasn't around when I started my, my trade show career. And another thing is, you know, going back to Julie said about being kind to yourself. Uh, I can remember my early shows. I had a different boss back then, and he was really particular about details. And he would be on me you know, every 20 or 30 minutes at the trade show going, you know, can we do this? Can we do this? Can we change that? Can we add this? And I was so overwhelmed because I, in my mind, I'm thinking I have to make him happy. I have to make sure all these things happen. And then I took a step back and realized, well, this isn't all possible, but my job is to find out if they're possible, what they cost, and then come to the, my boss and say, well, yes, we can do it, or no, we can't, and here's what we're looking at in terms of investment or time or whatever it may be. And once, once the team you're working with, your boss or whomever it is, understands that there's more to this than it looks, and there is. There's a lot more to it than it looks from people who aren't involved in it. Um, I think you'll find it's easier to work work through some of those challenges up front. Yeah, it's one of the things actually, one of the things I was thinking from an advice perspective would have been um, similar to what you said, Kristen, actually, about just, just develop a very good filtering mechanism for for those inevitable requests that happen on the stand. Um, you, 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 you develop, a, I, I developed a mechanism for, for deciding without telling the person who was asking me for the specific change or the thing to be done, deciding very quickly in my head whether whether I was going to do anything with that information or not. Um, um, or whether I, I, I was, I would never have said, I'm not doing that. 
but it was like I'm going to ignore that because I know it'll go away. Um, yeah. Whereas, whereas <laughs> other other whereas other things, you're like, okay, I have to do this, um, because you've got with a stand team, like you said, with a stand team of fifty to twenty people and senior people in the organisation, they turn it up with us this and move this and do this, and can we have this extra? Just from a capacity and a logistics point of view, you have to be able to decide internally, okay what is actually possible here and what is going to improve the overall experience rather than an awful an awful lot of the time suggestions are, a, are are quite a subjective emotional reaction to something rather than you know we've been across an awful lot of data and research to get to the point where we have on the stand so trying to maintain that while staying agile um, and accepting your own limitations time wise trying to combine all those things and if you can tell me how <laughs> uh, and that ends up delivering a better sort of show experience for everybody i think um, and I'm, I'm very conscious of time here we're, we're having we're, there's there's an awful lot we're covering here but i'm i'm conscious um of time so i'm going to skip skip through a few more questions and, and something you touched on there Kristen. and um, from the outside the shows can all look very glamorous um, and it's hard to convince people that they're not whenever you come back from las vegas in march with a tan having been stood outside for seven days and and people family friends colleagues who were working out of the office were saying oh you were in a jolly in vegas for the week but um how important is a pair of comfortable shoes and a comfortable bed oh my gosh they're paramount um and not only we'll start with the bed thing not only a comfortable bed but i like if we're in Vegas and I'm there for two weeks because show set up, show tear down, it's, it can be two weeks sometimes or longer. I like to get um, a room where I can at least have a fridge and maybe a microwave and way of making my own food because I don't want to be eating out all the time. It will kill me. I'd rather just have, let's say, oatmeal and tea in my room in the morning and not have to go to Starbucks every day. Not to mention you're waiting in line for two hours at Starbucks in Vegas. And I'm not even kidding. It's crazy. Um, so yeah, I think the comfortable room and giving yourself time to breathe in that room, like you need some alone time every day or your team will drive you crazy because they'll be on you with all kinds of requests. Um, so you, you need to carve out that five minutes for yourself and make sure your bed's comfortable and you have some nice healthy snacks. Um, as far as shoes, I used to do the cute shoes. I've done heels at Vama. Forget it. They're, you must have comfortable shoes and not just one pair. I often bring two or three or one or two extra pairs with me to the show every day so I can change them every few hours because your feet are much happier when you do. Um, and we've got to the point where with our team where running shoes, if they look, you know, fairly professional are perfectly acceptable. Yeah, because I, I mean, I, I fully subscribe to the opinion that if your feet are sore, you're just in a bad mood. I must. <laughs> and not only during the show, but during setup week as well. You need to be comfortable. It's paramount. Yeah. How about you, Julie? I mean, what? Yeah, we uh, we always rent a house on Airbnb or VRBO or a similar uh, homestay program. And uh, I put the setup crew there. So it's like this little family pocket. That's, uh, that's always a lot of fun, you know, sort of take turns cooking and and everybody has their own space. We usually make sure it's a big enough layout that nobody's on top of each other because that can be a little weird with your coworkers. So uh, we just make sure that it's all laid out nicely. And uh, it's great because I usually stay right through while the setup crew will go home and I'll stay right through. And anybody who wants to stay off strip in Con Expo, uh, and there are more people than you can imagine who quietly would like to be off strip, um, will come and stay at the house. And then we have it for the teardown as well. So it's really quite comfortable. I, I head off to the local grocery stores and everything and I load up the fridge and, and we pack up lunches every day in the back of the car and it's it's quite fun um and then what we do generally for footwear well first con expo i learned very quickly when a colleague needed me to go to a drugstore and buy every blister guard blister bandage blister band-aid whatever it was that they had for her and I was not far behind her. So I was delighted that she made the request. So yeah, I bring two or three pairs usually. And uh, at the end of the show day, those uh, any other shoe other than running shoes are off immediately and into running shoes. Okay, okay. Um, 
And then at the show, can you tell us a little bit then, you know, obviously the inquiries and the sales leads are, are the most important part of, of the work you do at the show. Kristen, could you tell us about some of the different mechanisms that you used for capturing those inquiries and, and how maybe that's changed over the time that you've been involved? Mm -hmm. So yeah, Peter, when I started, I, like you, would build a trade show lead form on paper with all the questions, places to fill in the contact information. We'd have lots of pens on hand and clipboards and a stapler so you could staple a business card on there. And then I would go home and enter every one of them into an Excel sheet. And that was obviously very painful, not to mention you can make mistakes with phone numbers, emails, you name it. So that's where it started. And then I realized very quickly that, oh, these shows offer lead retrieval systems. These can be expensive. I mean, I, I just booked one for Ag One. I think it's just over a thousand dollars, which sounds like a lot of money, but I mean, a thousand dollars, if you're going to sell a multi thousand dollar piece of equipment is totally worth it. So the shows kind of have a monopoly on this where it's not the same system every time. It's not like you can buy the software yourself. Uh, but it's definitely worth the investment. You can you know, set it up with your own survey questions. You can have check boxes based on you know what you're bringing to the show, but they're absolutely worth it and totally my recommendation. Okay, I'm assuming your experience is similar, Julie. It is, yeah, absolutely. And I find that um, it's interesting. I was at a compost show last month and somebody came up and asked me for a pen. I didn't have a pen. It's like, pen? Really? Okay, those are packed up in the little merch thing that we're going to give away to people. That you, You're asking me to use a pen. It, it's changed so much, you know, from the earlier days where it's now all digital. Okay, and then thinking about rolling that, rolling that forward then to when you come home after the show, how do you go about managing that post-show activity then? How do you work with the sales guys and your dealers, Julie, as well, to... Um, to, to manage that process and make sure you can sort of track the response to those inquiries as you as you go on before the planning starts for the next one. Well, in the early days, obviously, we we would sit there with our Excel spreadsheets and and try and plug in all the leads and and sort them by territories and names and and shoe sizes and whatever else we were measuring against. Um, now it's a little bit different in that. Um, similar to what uh, Kristen's using at Ag1, I am as well. And the swap portal does most of the hard, heavy lifting for you. Um, it also provides real time. So instead of me having to wait until after the show to get the leads to my salespeople, if I've got a hot lead that day, I can get it to them before they go out and have dinner that night. So it's, it's changed radically in that respect that we're now much more responsive. And the follow-up is a lot easier for us, enabled by the technology out there. Okay, and how about you, Kristen? Is it similar to you? Yeah, it's similar. And, and the technology also allows you to build like follow up marketing programs where we didn't, when it was an ex, when your contact information was in an Excel sheet, that wasn't as easy to do. But now you have different pieces of marketing software like HubSpot, for example, where you can load those leads in and say, okay, this is how I'm going to nurture those leads until they're ready to buy. So the programs out there to take care of leads now are phenomenal compared to the old spreadsheets or literally even the pdf um, forms that i used to send out to the sales team you know over a decade ago i mean it's it's come leaps and bounds yeah i mean what, one of the things it goes, it's connected to this one but it's, it's probably maybe rolling back to, to when we're at the show a little bit um do, do either of you do you know, it goes back to your point julia about you know whenever you leave the show i mean my i remember my notes function on my phone used to be just full of for the week because you know you'd see something on a stand somewhere and you'd be like oh, it'd be a good idea to try that at the next show or you know this didn't work as well as i thought it was going to or so just so it was documented and it was fresh in your head how do you approach the sort of the, do, do, did you do an end of day briefing with with the stand team at all to figure out okay who are we speaking to today who are the hot prospects who have we got coming tomorrow what time are they coming who do we need to have here for when they're coming was was that part of your the way you you work at the shows sort of uh <laughs> it's a little more casual than that i think um there was nothing ever formally done in that respect there is a formal briefing at the front end of the show about what we're trying to achieve and what the new products are and what is expected of everybody on the stand dealers and staff um during the show it's a lot more um it's a role that I take on 
very actively because I'm quite passionate to make sure that nobody misses any opportunities or or any information. So um, during the day, it's more ongoing. And then towards the end of the day, if I uh, happen to be out for dinner at a dealer dinner with the sales reps, then we'll do a little postmortem, a hash out ourselves on that. So a little more casual, okay. I think. Okay, how about you, Kristen? Is it as structured as I laid it, or maybe a little bit more casual? It's similar. We we do a pre-show meeting with the entire team where we go through the booth and what's going on that week and everything. And that will often happen either the afternoon before the show opens or the morning of, depending on the schedule. And then for a bigger show, like a Con Expo or a Mine Expo, we'll generally do a quick like huddle every morning where we get everyone together and say, okay, is there anything remarkable that happened yesterday? What's going on today? What are the events happening today? If there's a dinner or a lunch or a meeting, what have you. Um, just so everyone's kind of aware of the schedule and, and what's coming up for that that next day. And then also we always put together um, a WhatsApp, WhatsApp chat group so that everyone on the show floor or on the show team is in that WhatsApp prep chat group. And uh, if there's anything, if I need to remind them of something during the day or something cool happens, we can just chat with each other that way. So if you're not on the show floor at that point, if you're off having lunch or you're at a meeting, you still get those updates. Okay. Okay. Um, just a couple, a couple of things to wrap up now. I mean, and this, this is largely um, based on my own experience, but you know, the whole, the whole trade show marketing experience, it's hard, it's stressful. There's a big investment of time and money, um, but we keep going back. So start with you, Julie, what are the best and worst parts of the trade show experience for you? Oh, that is a narrow question because I would have about a hundred items for each category. Um, I think the best is I really need to get out and see people. And I know our customers do too. And our sales reps do too. And I think it really, the best part of the trade show is just that getting out. Now, of course, this may be, you know, magnified by being in a bubble for two years and away from people. But, you know, even before COVID hit, I was just always so happy to see everyone and be out there um, and the opportunity to, to exchange ideas constantly. Uh, the worst part, I think, honestly, Peter, like they, I can't even really come up with anything concrete because they come tend on. to come up on the fly. On the fly, all of a sudden, everything's going great. And all of a sudden, everything derails. And then you're back on track again and everything derails. So a specific example, yeah, no, yeah. but more around the okay. fact that the the unpredictability of certain things can be a little rattling. And if you can't find an immediate solution, that can be a little demoralizing. Okay. And how about you, Kristen? Best and worst? Yeah, the best is definitely the people. I mean, you don't get to see these people every day or even every year for that matter. So just reconnecting with customers, with dealers, with uh, the marketing team that you get to know throughout uh, Setup Week is is fantastic. Um, and just watching people experience everything that you've created is just really cool. And you're like, I built this. This is my baby. And like all these people just experiencing the equipment and the interactions with people, that's when you have a chance to step back and look at that every now and then, that's that's just an awesome feeling. The worst part, I mean, like Julie, I think I've come to the point where you just expect the worst and you just get through it and you get through it and you know you're going to have multiple tragedies and chaotic moments every single day and you just get through them. There's always, I always have one moment where I'm like, oh my God, I can't, I can't fix this. I just can't. I don't know what to do. And then five minutes passes and you take a walk and you get a coffee and you're like, okay, it's just gonna I'm back. I can do it. I, I can was do just going to say that that's, have... the, that's the point. Where, that's the point where you go for a walk, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because you can't let anyone see that. You you can't fall apart in front of your team. Yeah. You have to just. They need to know that you're in control, and you got to make them comfortable and keep them going. So. So you will have that okay. moment, and you okay. just got to get through it. <laughs> Yeah, the big surprise for me is there nobody mentioned stand uniforms is the worst part of it. Um, <laughs> I always find, I always, th between that and Julie's point of, of the hotel room bookings just changing like seven mm -hmm. hours before people are due to arrive, you know. <laughs> um, those two yeah. things, it would have been enough. Yeah, if I could if I could remove those things from the trade show <laughs> experience, I, I, do, I wouldn't, I, I would happily accept everything else. 
Um, yeah. And finally, just to wrap up then, um, so what's the next big thing on the agenda for you trade show wise? If we start with you, Julie, and what, what have you got anything big planned at it? Actually, very exciting. Uh, a big trade show in a new market with a new team um, is coming up. Uh, we ha have just committed to XCON India in Bangalore in May. So that is, uh, we've now opened up facilities in India for manufacturing in a sales office and just signed on a couple of new dealers. So there's a lot wrapped up in this show now, whereas before it was, let's put a stand into XCON India. Now it's, we have new dealerships to celebrate. We have new manufacturing capabilities to tell people about. We have, you know, so many exciting developments in that region. So that's the next big one for us. And uh, because there's no template for it, like Con Expo or Obama for us, it's going to be pretty exciting to move ahead with. Very good. Very good. And how about you, Kristen? I mean, we're just so excited to be back at Trade Show Life. We're going to Ag One in Nashville, and Nashville is one of my favorite cities, not to mention trade show cities in the U.S. So I'm really looking forward to that, and the team here is as well. And then also, we uh, took on responsibility for Australia just before COVID, so we haven't really done any trade show work there, but that's something we're looking at doing this summer as well. And I have a little bit of experience from working with our Australian team back in, back a few years ago, but I haven't really taken the lead on that. So. Just looking forward to you know building a new connection with a new trade show house and understanding how things work there and i've learned that on the different continents trade shows do work quite a bit differently so we'll have to see how things work in australia but it's, no, it's, it's great to see and i mean it's um there's definitely plenty of global opportunities going on there and as we know um the last conversation i had with you both last week in preparation for this was an expensive one because within 24 hours i was suddenly <laughs> going to i go on in nashville so um um, so I'm looking forward to that myself. I'm, I'm, the, I'm, look, I'm looking forward to going as a visitor this time and seeing all the work that, that you and everybody else has put in. So um, thank you very much for your time. I'm conscious that you know this is this is Monday morning in Canadian time. So so very appreciative of you taking your Monday mornings out to do this with us. Hopefully um, the people who are watching find that useful. And um, good luck with the next trade show. Good luck with XCON in India, Julie. Um, and I will see you both in, in Nashville in May. And just the final thing to say, I suppose, is thanks to everyone who, who watched back, who watched this. And it'll obviously be available to watch back again on our various different channels, which we'll share the links to over the next while. So thanks very much for joining us, everyone, and hope you find that useful.